That being said, it certainly uh, gave Masaccio the opportunity to focus on what will become a major um, theme, I think, within Italian art of the 15th century, and that is the, um, the large-scale narrative, showing figures in action doing important things. There's a term for this um, that gains uh, widespread usage in the 15th and into the 16th century, and that is the Historia, I-S-T-O. R I A, but this is the focus and the, uh, of uh, an artist's work, and this is something that Lam Battista Alberti <coughs> makes abundantly clear in his work on painting. That this is the highest ambition that an artist can aspire to—to to create an historia that impresses upon the uh, mind and, and really soul of the viewer um, the significance of the actions of the people portrayed in the painting, and indeed seeks to alter, influence uh, the viewer in some way. So for instance, in this uh, scene right here, somebody looking at the fresco and um, seeing the actions of Christ and the discussions of disciples might uh, himself, and, and this is really addressed primarily toward a male population, uh, be influenced to, to do similarly great things in, in, his, or, um, uh, yeah, in, his, in his life. The kind of visual rhetoric that's appropriate to an historia uh, was a subject of discussion in Alberti's um, uh, own work, and he, and he describes at some length the kinds of things that the artist should be able to do in order to make an historia work. So uh, primarily among these are going to be the use of gesture, which we can see abundantly in uh, the tribute money, the use, for instance, of hands and, and um, you know pointing to the uh, to the the image there, Peter at the lake. And it's worth pointing out that there's this uh, in this scene, and and this detail is skipping one part where Peter actually pays the tax collector off to the right. We'll see if we can find that detail. Um, but the sense of of hands pointing here's Peter, and then here's Peter again, giving a sense of of flow of time and, and place is important. Another aspect of the story that's crucial for Alberti is emotional expression. And you can see the ways in which Masaccio has presented Christ's and his disciples in this kind of monumental and serious fashion. There's a, a term for this um, in Roman rhetoric, uh, this, the sense of gravitas, uh, the sense of responsibility and seriousness is enhanced uh, uh, by that, these, these, these solid uh, figures. And of course, it doesn't hurt that Masaccio has given them you know, very stable postures and clad them in very Roman looking uh, robes, you know, beautiful colors, but, but you know, carefully controlled colors. And in a sense, drawing upon the, the legacy of Giotto, because I, th I think it, it must have been the case that Masaccio somehow had uh, knowledge, understanding of the Arena Chapel in Padua. Drawing upon Giotto, he takes it one step further, giving these figures weight and substance. And that is uh, through the use of light. And we'll dig a little bit more into that in a second. Okay, so we're, we're still talking about the idea of the Historia and the sense of a serious narrative. So Masaccio is given uh, this uh, episode uh, a kind of aura of grandeur, I guess is the best way of describing it, that I think is very much rooted in classical humanist uh, precepts. Um, but nevertheless, Masaccio is an artist, he's not a humanist, and so he may quote uh, classical sculpture, we can see that for instance in the contrapposto uh, attitude here of the tax collector. There's clearly a sense of, again, borrowings from classical statuary in the group of the disciples. There's also, though, I think, a recognition uh, of contemporary developments. And uh, for that, we should maybe take a quick look uh, at, at, at sculpture. OK, so um, when, I, when I was talking about sculpture, I'm, I'm talking really about contemporary developments in sculpture. Obviously, Roman sculpture is still around in, in Italy, and, and people can certainly, uh, artists can refer to that. But more specifically, I want to focus on the work of, of Masaccio's contemporaries, what would have been available right there in the streets uh, in, in Florence, for instance. And a, and a great place to begin, I think, is to consider the figures that we would see, for instance, 
in a work by uh, the sculptor Nanni de Banco on the exterior of Or San Michele, right in the heart of Florence, which Masaccio, growing up in Florence, could hardly have um, ignored. And it shows, and I think this is, this is why it's such a good example of, of what I'm talking about, it shows four actors on a stage of sorts, right, uh, in this uh, architectural niche, four individuals grouped in a semicircle within this uh, niche, and they're, um, they're trying to decide essentially what to do. And, and the situation is remarkably similar to that of Christ and the disciples, because these sculptors are from the, uh, the era of Roman antiquity. They're sculptors who've been asked by the Emperor Diocletian, one of the most notorious persecutors of Christianity. They've been asked by Diocletian to make a pagan idol, and they have refused, and therefore their lives essentially are forfeit. They're going to be uh, prosecuted and, and executed by the by the emperor. So I think it's very, very likely, especially given the strong visual similarities, the robes, the distinguished uh, postures and gestures of these figures, it's very, very likely that Masaccio drew upon uh, this sculptural uh, group in particular for inspiration, understanding of how to organize uh, figures uh, in a uh, in a group, uh, thinking and doing serious things. And, and we can see the use of, of contrapposto, the sense of weight shift is very strong in Nani de Banco's work, as you can see in this figure right here, moving weight from one leg to the next, uh, one leg uh, to the other, the, uh, the term being contrapposto, C-O-N-T-R-A-P-P-O-S-T-O, a uh, technique that was uh, perfected really in the era of Greek art and preserved in, in uh, Roman Roman art as well. So I, I think that looking at Nanda de Bongo as a point of comparison I think is very strong. And the sense of three-dimensionality and relief, which is another important part of uh, Italian art theory at the time, is also evident in this group. And I think that uh, Masaccio must have, again, derived inspiration for his perhaps most inventive visual technique. And that is a good uh, understanding of the properties of light. Now, in this, uh, in this way, I, or at least in this section, I would, when I'm talking about light, I want to try to draw a distinction between the way that someone like Jan van Eyck, for instance, might perceive and, and represent light and the way that Masaccio does. It, I think, is not too much of a generalization when we think of the uh, sort of Eyckian mode of light to go and um, take, let's just look really, really quickly back uh, just, a, just a few slides there to look at that Ghent altarpiece in just a little bit of detail, and we can just we can literally zoom in anywhere we like. I think uh, a great place to start uh, might be just uh, the central uh, the central group here. And as we close in on uh, these figures, we can see the extraordinary uh, precision with which. Jan van Eyck has shown the way that light lands on the surface of things, right? So for instance, the scepter right here is clearly made of crystal or glass, the reflective properties of gems and, and so on. And, and, and the extraordinary accuracy uh, with which Jan van Eyck has represented this sort of draws us in uh, to his world, his visual world. But something that's a little bit lacking, I think, and, and we can maybe sense this as we pull out just a bit, is the idea that these figures possess a kind of independent three-dimensionality. There's still this feeling that they're somehow within the matrix of the painted panel. Okay, that the space that they inhabit is not entirely believable. And this is not helped, for instance, in this group of angels on the left by the sense of compression, for instance, uh, the space they occupy. Now let's, again, compare this really, really quickly uh, with the sense of the figures, and I'm just going to go ahead to the to the full view of uh, that that scene from the tribute money. The way in which these figures, this group, stands apart from their setting, okay, and that the way that they do possess a kind of independent three dimensionality, okay. Each figure stands apart. We don't have any trouble making that mental leap from two dimensional fresco right here to three-dimensional 
figures operating within uh, that pictorial space. Okay, so that we don't get the sense of painted figures necessarily on a surface. However, you know, immaculately, uh, Jan van Eyck represents the textures of fabrics or hair, or whatever. We never get the sense that the figures are actually operating independently in space. And Jodoth, especially through his use of light, makes that work for us. We can see a very clearly identifiable light source coming in from the upper left that strikes the figures and defines them in clear relief. And they create very distinct shadows right? that uh, uh, behave the way that we'd expect shadows to behave. And so the entire group here seems somehow to exist almost independently of the two-dimensional surface they're painting on. And this is a, a really uh, path-breaking discovery, and in many ways I think did surpass uh, any of the um, contributions made by classical art, at least the ones that we have access to, because it makes this mental leap from two-dimensional flat painting, say, on a panel like in tempera or on fresco, and even Giotto's figures, despite their three-dimensionality, never get that sense of, of independence from it, uh, the painted surface. That Masaccio's uh, real contribution is precisely that of independent actors making decisions and um, doing so in a, in a believable way. So again, as we look at this uh, uh, scene here, we see the Roman tax collector as asking for the money. Again, very beautifully posed classical uh, figure right here. The um, <coughs> uh, disciple here, Peter, uh, is given the command to go to the Lake of Galilee, which he does, and he gets the fish, and the money's within the fish's mouth, and we come back again to Peter paying off the tax collector. And you'll notice that the tax collector himself is basically just a mirror image, right, from the back and from the front in, in, in these two instances. So you get the sense of the, the narrative sort of coming full circle. This technique of simultaneous narrative is a very old-fashioned one. It's, it's worth pointing out, one that um, is somewhat uh, you know, unrealistically has multiple I uh, iterations of the same figure, in this case, uh, St. Peter. Okay. Well, it's, that's not the only thing that Masaccio does. Um, it's, it's very, very impressive. Um, and, and again, Vasari, writing in the 16th century, makes the note, um, right, the works before Masaccio's day can s be said to be painted. Masaccio's figures are living, real, and natural. Well, it's, again, not just the figures themselves that are doing this. It's also the setting. So Masaccio presents the viewer with a coherent total environment in which to uh, uh, do uh, the things that, that are important, the things that we look on uh, at, that we view. And to show you what I mean by that, we see the ways in which, for instance, he's incorporated linear perspective in the building to the right. There's this little loggia-like, this porch-like um, uh, area right here, very nicely done, again, in terms of light and shade. But we can see the ways in which he's tried to construct a mathematically accurate uh, representation of linear perspective in that structure as well. And then, to take it uh, further and deeper into space, he creates a uh, landscape in the background which moves very, very subtly but effectively from relatively close up. So for instance, we can see here uh, hills with the characteristic dividing hedges and and uh, trees and, and small uh, uh, houses and, and villages, what have you. And then as we move further back, and this is visually, we're basically just moving along here, we can see those details begin to fade away. And then they begin to disappear altogether, and the mountains become much paler and more blue. And this is a, a great illustration of the use of what's called linear, per, uh, not linear, but aerial perspective, atmospheric perspective which represents not the mathematical certainty of the measurable uh, certainty of linear perspective, but a kind of intuitive visual perspective that reflects our own experiences looking at distant, uh, say, mountain ranges or things like this.